Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, depending on where you're based. Um, I want to thank everybody for joining us. We have about 95 participants right now, but I think we'll have a few more joining over the next few minutes. But we wanted to um, make a timely start because we have a great panel with some fantastic panelists and a lot to talk about. So I'm going to say just a few words at the beginning, and then I'm going to hand over to our, our panel. Um, so everybody's really excited about fintech and new business models um, and all of the excitement that technology is bringing to financial services for the poor. But there's a little less attention paid to legacy entities who are going through digital transformation, which to my mind is an equally important topic, and that's the subject of our discussion today. Um, I'm joined on the panel by some of the best thinkers on this topic that I know, actually. Um, I've been lucky enough to work with all of them in one way or another, usually on the subject of digital transformation. And the great thing is, in this group, we have the perspective of funders, investors, practitioners, and advisors. And there are literally decades of experience sitting around this virtual table. We think it's a good time to look at this topic, given that we now have almost a decade of experience under our belts. Um, and CGAP's really interested in looking past the hype to see what works and what the challenges are so we can learn from this and make sure that pro-poor financial services providers are equipped to thrive in the digital age. Um, before we get started, um, I want to just make a couple of logistical points. Um, I'm going to ask each of our panelists to respond to a question that enables them to tell you about their experience and perspectives on digital transformation. We'll do a follow-up round, and then I'm going to open it up for questions from the audience for around 15 to 20 minutes at the end of the conversation. Um, if you have questions, please send them through on the chat function on WebEx, and if your questions are better than mine, I might ask them earlier. Um, and to make sure your question is seen by the moderator, please be sure that you click on all participants when you send it. Um, beyond that, if everybody could please keep your phones muted when you're not speaking, we would greatly appreciate it. So without further ado, um, I wanted to introduce to you the distinguished panelists. I'm going to just cover their name and institutional affiliation, and then I'll let you, uh, them fill you in on the details of their background and experience when they speak. So, um, I'm very pleased to introduce Mark Flaming, who has a long and illustrious career in this space, um, um, most recently at Yoma Bank in Myanmar, but formerly was working with the MicroCred Network. Um, Momina Ijazuddin, who's sitting uh, with us here at the IFC, um, who has been involved in IFC's microfinance work for many, many years. We've got Geraldine O'Keefe from the Software Group, based out of Kenya, who's provided technology solutions to microfinance institutions and banks around the world for many years. Um, Graham Wright, who is with um, MSC, which all of us still sort of think of as Microsave, so I'm going to um, do the new brand and the old one so everybody knows Graham. Uh, and then Ruth Duikembeba from the MasterCard Foundation, who I had the privilege of working with on digital transformation of MFIs um, for a number of years when I was at the IFC. So um, I'd like to thank all of my panelists for joining, and I'm going to hand it over to them. So let's kick off um, with Mark. So, Mark, you've now managed digital transformations in two financial institutions, MicroCred and Yoma Bank. Can you talk us through um, that experience, perhaps in the most recent um, one you managed, Yoma Bank, and tell us about the bank, what the rationale was for transforming, and how you approached this process. And as you began to implement um, the transformation, were you surprised by anything? Um, certainly. Thanks. Thanks, Greta, and greetings to everyone. Um, let me just do a quick check. You can all hear me, right? We can. Great. All right. Um, yes, Yoma Bank um, started uh, its its journey in Myanmar in uh, in 2017. Uh, it was a fairly uh, new bank, a corporate bank that decided to go the other direction than most of us in the room here. Um, a corporate bank that looked to its market, its emerging market, and thought. Um, we, we must be able to reach the mass market with a, a robust, retail, uh, robust retail value proposition. So I, I show the slide to you because I think you know, it's interesting, uh, having worked with microcred, where you're starting as a microfinance institution and thinking of mass market as uh, a significant expansion of, of, of retail into a broader, broader market segments and broader, um, broader products and services. Um, from the corporate bank standpoint, the mass market was also an expansion in the same sense, but from a balance sheet perspective, you know, it represented a much smaller piece of its, uh, of its business model. Um, I think the key lessons, uh, regardless of the fact that 
one starts as a corporate bank, the other as a microfinance institution end up being very similar. Um, I think today um, all the panelists in one way or another are going to talk about the major things, the core, core competencies that any financial institution, the sort of challenges that they need to meet, core competencies that they need to develop. And we, we will talk a lot about IT. Uh, I'm sure Geraldine will speak to that. Um, I'm going to speak more to um, what's often referred to as agile or lean management culture um, and the skill sets that go along with it. Because this is where, I think these are the core set of competencies that allow an institution to navigate, to navigate this process. At Yoma Bank, um, we started out with a very ambitious long-term view of how we wanted to do this. And so I'm going to start with, with the magnitude of, of what this is. And in three years, we're talking about roughly a $6 million investment. Um, the investment went into developing a, um, a, a modern IT stack. We had started, the bank had just started with its own uh, installing of the core banking system and actually was probably not much farther along than many of the MFIs on this call. Um, but we had an ambition to turn that into a modern IT stack. And so that meant uh, a core banking system with an open API gateway, a modern middleware layer uh, with a microservice architecture and supported by a full data warehouse. Um, there were 70 people um, 70 people staffed in the department that was doing the product development. That's not counting the IT. Another 15 people in the data warehouse and business intelligence unit. So just, if you just think about the magnitude of, of an institution that really has its eyes set on a five-year horizon of actually building the capacity to be able to move into the market, you know, we're talking in the order of a $6 million investment over three years. And I think that's a fairly reasonable um, benchmark for what it takes for those institutions that start with that kind of envision. Um, I think the key takeaway that I would like to share from Yoma Bank's experience, though, is that um, for most institutions, starting with that $6 million three-year vision will probably get them into a lot of trouble. <laughs> the, with, at, at, we were fortunate that we started out, I think, with an awareness of that at Yoma Bank. And we started out with a two-speed uh, two approach to implementation. And I think that for many institutions, particularly microfinance institutions, it is the slow speed um, that will be economically sort of more efficient and it will also lead to better results. So the first speed that I'm talking about is the investment that I mentioned, the idea of installing this new IT stack and, develop, and developing these new capabilities. And we did that and we made that investment and we went at high speed to develop these things. And in the two and a half years uh, that, that, we, that I was involved in this, the um, the, at the same time, we implemented in parallel the ability to launch minimum viable products into the market. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what that is because I think that's where many of our surprises came. During the entire time, um, this, this very, very robust and complete architecture that we were building, um, we never brought one single product to market with it. It was still in construction by the time we had reached 350,000 customers, um, 250 million euros in mobilized deposits, um, digital credit portfolios worth $220 million. And we did all of that with the slow speed minimum viable products. So basically as we were setting up this new modern architecture, we built a couple of, of, um, of products, channels, and services using very, very simple minimal products. One, um, we launched um, on top of the core banking system, we used the core banking vendor's app to give people a simple mobile app early on in the process. 
We issued people a card, uh, a debit card. Um, and then we went to work creating um, a remote sign-up app so that we could sign people up outside the branches. We built a digital credit product using uh, a third-party vendor, Experian. It was, the, it, was exact, it was the same digital credit engine that they built for Equity Bank. Uh, we built a portal for our leasing product, which we put inside of the, um, the car and uh, agricultural equipment dealers that were um, using our leasing product to finance the purchase of their products. And we also launched eventually our, our app, the app, our own full service app that we used to replace the, the, the vendor's app. And I think that this is the this is the key point that even though we started out as an institution with a set of shareholders fully committed to a very very large investment with a time horizon a fairly ambitious time horizon um, it was the fact that we were able to deliver um, results in a very very short period of time in the first two years using using digital products and services that weren't even built on this new architecture. We did them, frankly, by setting up a, a small middleware environment where we built, um, we built web-based applications. And a lot of times we built these things in um, six to eight weeks. Very, very simple things that allowed our business teams to actually get out there in the market and put these products in front of customers. And I would say that, uh, that the, Biggest surprise to us was how long it took us to implement the big investment. And it frankly also surprised us at how effective some of these less expensive and very lean and agile um, minimum viable products were. Um, that what it, what it really did is that in the first couple of years where the institution had everybody focused on building all of this architecture, it's also very, very critical to demonstrate that in an 18 to 24 month window, it's actually possible to use technology to create a new value proposition that customers want. And so being able to show that people will sign up remotely, that people will use your digital credit product, that they will, they will self-serve by signing onto the app, managing their savings accounts, requesting services, sending money, receiving money, these early signs of customer adoption are what feed and sustain the long-term management and customer, I'm sorry, um, shareholder commitment to continuing with um, the process. And I would say if I draw a, you know, distinction between the two, my two main experiences with this, one with, with uh, microcred and the other with, um, with Yoma Bank, it's that the two-speed process was more effective at, at Yelma Bank precisely for this reason, of being able to show all the stakeholders in the process that was, in fact, delivering value that customers were accepting early in the process to, the same, to sustain the commitment to this larger, to this larger scale. Um, yes, I'll, I'll stop with summarizing the key point. It is... When you hear people talk about agile or lean business processes, it typically refers to the product development cycle. But in fact, it's bigger than that. And that is that even thinking about the broader investment roadmap, um, planning an investment that accepts that in the long run, if you are successful and you scale it, you will invest five to six million dollars. But along the way, finding inexpensive and fast ways to get to market to be able to prove that you actually do have a value proposition that will work for the bank and that will work for the customers. Um, the, the ability to create a management culture around that um, is what will make or break the, the, the endeavor. I'll stop there. Thanks a lot, Mark. A lot of really good food for thought, and I'm sure we'll have a lot of questions for you on that. Um, but let me turn next to Ruth Duikambeba. 
Um, Ruth, the MasterCard Foundation has partnered with a lot of different organizations, four network holdings, the IFC and UNCDF on digital transformation. Can you tell us a little bit about what the Foundation's objectives were for those partnerships, what was achieved, and what some of the key learnings were from your perspective as a, a donor? Thank you, Greta. Um, yes, as you can see, um, we've, we've done a fair bit of work in this space um, over the last eight, nine years. Uh, if you think back to the context of when we started all this uh, thinking in late 2010 and 2011 and 2012, uh, particularly in Africa where we are focused, mobile money through MNOs is really becoming much more popular, uh, although many deployments were not fully up to date. Uh, you know, the 2011 FINDEX spoke to really high levels of unbanked and underbanked in Africa. And banks and MFIs were starting to take notice of, of market shifts, uh, many of them beginning to question their own relevance. Uh, some had fears of becoming obsolete. But many also saw the promise of opportunity that technology could bring. And there were a few early pioneers, uh, like Equity Bank, but the vast majority of, of banks and microfinance institutions had not yet stepped into that digitization journey. So our partners were launched from 2011 to late 2016, and the latter ones remain in implementation stage. Um, so it, 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 these past, this past decade has been a, a huge shift in the African landscape of both uh, digital financial services and the financial sector. It's been a time of acquisitions, sales, partnerships and other ownership shifts. And we saw that reflected in our portfolio as well. Um, the foundation at the time, um, focus on financial inclusion was really a time to think about scaling. Um, we really wanted to just uh, help to change the, the narrative and also really uh, expand access to financial services. We're very interested to do that for the unbanked, for underserved segments, uh, for more challenging segments like rural populations, women, secondary cities. Um, and so a lot of that was reflected through these deployments who reached to those target segments. Uh, we also wanted to help providers think really deeply about what serving those customer segments meant. What are the needs for a rural farmer in country A or B? How do we design for meaningful um, financial inclusion that's also affordable and relevant and accessible? So we wanted um, FSPs and give them an opportunity to revisit and explore new business models, approaches on how to reach those segments. But what we didn't do in all of this work was really to prescribe how um, financial service providers would address challenges. And in hindsight, as we sit now in reflection, um, they all saw the opportunity to begin that journey of digitization. So over 35 banks, MFIs, participated in varying levels of, in that institutional digitization, um, touching just a fraction of their other network banks, their other investees and partners. It was a very broad diversity of, of organizations. We had large commercial banks, uh, local national banks, international network banks, um, financial, uh, microfinance institutions, uh, some financial cooperatives out of, coming out of West Africa. And our support was for project management of, of this transformation, business and, and um, model planning, specialists, IT, IT infrastructure training, change management, uh, business reengineering. So as you've just heard from Mark, um, you know, these major transformations don't come with a small price tag, but different approaches were taken by these banks because they were all at different phases. And so for some of the banks, it was that long, slow process of building up the infrastructure. Others took much more, um, less expensive and measured steps, more incremental, uh, lower cost investments, and also then lower change. And what we find today is that this is really still an ongoing work in progress. Uh, growth continues, uh, challenges continue, change continues in both markets, in technologies, and so business models have to continue evolving and strategies uh, have to continue evolving. So what, you know, in hindsight, as, as we reflect now and think about what we've really learned, I think our reflections really come from the perspective of a 
philanthropic private funder. And the the role that we are allowed to play because of that, both in terms of uh, taking risks, of, of not needing an immediate uh, payback or a return, of giving a space for learning, for knowledge generation. And I think those are the, the things in hindsight that I think um, a funder like ours can contribute to, to individual institutions, but also to local markets and to the industry more broadly. So first and foremost, um, we, can, we can help reduce the risk and upfront costs of innovation and testing. Um, because it, and there's soft and hard components of that, you know, working with people, um, helping them think of, uh, of understanding the landscape, of, of introducing them not just to new ideas, but to give them a sense of knowing what they don't know, of knowing the right questions to ask. And, and an organization like ours or a funding uh, mechanism like ours could help um, reduce risks and, and support that upfront cost of innovation and testing. Uh, secondly, um, because we're working with the private sector, we also value the foundation learning and, and uh, collaboration with others. And so we could also provide uh, not only resources uh, for learning time, but really create and carve out dedicated space. Uh, because learning reflection is really critical for ongoing adaptation and iteration of models and, and reflection of, of where you want to go. And so there is an element of, of the knowledge generation that we were able to, to um, really add to and contribute to, I think, from this body of work that still stands today. And, and many of these partners have, have published extensively. Um, but I think that's an important role for us as a funder and also important resource now for the industry. And then I think uh, in hindsight now also, the, the third thing that we were able to do is to kind of um, fuel with knowledge and with, with actual demonstrations in local markets, fuel the, the ongoing contribution to change. Uh, technology, as we all know, is not uh, going to diminish. It's, it's not, it doesn't stay the same. There's continual change and adaptation. And I think I think uh, the role of of contributing to that catalytic change and then transformation is really uh, another thing that that we as a funder uh, could contribute to in this space. And you know, granted, it, it sitting as a funder, you have a very different um, really a sense of detailed transfer or detailed understanding of what it takes to pull this off in a deployment in a bank. I think Mark often used the word we're, we're doing um, live open heart surgery uh, because you're 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 continuing on with the business, you're adapting the business, but you're also undergoing this massive transformation. So I think in hindsight, um, those are the the big reflections um, that I think we carry, and I think you'll hear as you listen to the other panelists, you'll hear, hear in much more detail the 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 narratives of change management, getting the the technology right, and that notion of continual change and adaptation. So I think, Greta, that, that's, that's in a nutshell my reflections today. Great. Thanks so much, Ruth. And that's a really good segue um, to um, speaking with Geraldine. So Geraldine, um, Software Group really comes at this very much from a technology perspective. And I've worked with you in the past on sort of helping demystify some of the technology um, aspects of this. Um, so really glad you can be here today. Um, how do you advise microfinance institutions or banks to, to think about starting the process of digital transformation? So what are the top priorities you think they should focus on as they embark on this process? And what kinds of trade-offs do they need to consider? Thanks, Greta, <clears throat> and good afternoon to everyone. So just as, as Greta said, and, and so people understand the perspective that I'm, I'm talking from, so I'm currently uh, the chief innovation officer and one of the co-founders of a technology company called software group um, and we look at digital banking solutions for all sorts of, of different financial service providers from MFIs all the way up to, to commercial banks and, and other players. We work globally, um, headquartered from Bulgaria and Kenya. We've had the, the good fortune to work with um, some of the people on the panel today as well as uh, some of the recipients uh, that, that um, 
MasterCard has worked with over time. So we do have a wealth of experience. We've been around for 10 years and, and certainly lots and lots of lessons learned. And I think, you know, to your specific question about sort of where to start and where to advise, it is to pick up uh, from, from what uh, Mark had said, which was, you know, laying the, uh, the foundation. And I think very often we see a lot of our clients, you know, feeling huge pressures to get started. They, they need to compete. They can feel the market changing and they know they've got to get something to market. So it's, it's you know, the, the pressure to get something out. It could be a mobile app. It could be connecting up to a, a fintech or whatever it is. But doing those projects sometimes without the, the sort of investment in time into what the overall architecture is and, and what they're aiming for and looking at all the various different elements of that architecture. So again, Mark mentioned things like middleware and moving into an open API, API architecture um, and what that may do to, to help simplify uh, innovation in the future. So, you know, investing, that's sort of one of the first things to think about is sort of looking at your overall architecture architecture, looking at the role of your of your core banking system. We've seen that actually, you know, core banking systems have changed massively over time. We used to look at them as, as the one-stop shop for everything that you needed to do within the, the, the bank or the MFI, and now people recognize the need for different types of systems and different types of vendors associated with that. Obviously, with more vendors and, and or shall we say, more systems, if you're building them in-house, that introduces a certain amount of complexity and risk. So I think um, certainly that is one thing to, to not only look, as again, as Mark said, is what are your low-hanging fruits? What is something that you can do that's a quick time to market, can, can prove the value proposition? That could be digital onboarding. It could be connecting up with an existing M wallet. It could be partnering with a fintech. While you make those longer-term structural changes in, in your systems uh, to be able to, to fuel continuous innovation and to refine the product offering once it has been tested. So I think definitely that, that's number, number one. The second thing I think, you know, and I say this as a vendor, but I know it's, uh, it, it's really happening from both sides. I think the markets are changing for everyone. You know, not only are financial service providers dealing with other types of competitors in the market, the vendor market has also changed. And what people need now is different from what they traditionally had been looking at, say, from a core banking system vendor. And this is where we see partnerships. And sometimes it is a pure partnership. And perhaps you might decide that rather than going and investing in a specific platform, you're going to partner with a fintech and allow them to, to do that innovation arm or provide whichever system it is that you're looking for. Um, but certainly what we see is that you know people investing a lot of time into trying to identify requirements, going to the market with, with a traditional sort of RFP procurement process only to realize that by the time the project starts, the requirements have changed already. And needless to say, by the time the system is ready to, to go live, they've changed yet again. So I think, you know, there is a need for people to look at their procurement processes, to look at their at the criteria that they're looking at for their, their partners and, and vendors and realize that it has changed. And and looking at you know how you're going to go on a journey with somebody rather than ask them to to deliver a specific um, a specific thing. In terms of pitfalls, um, and this this speaks to the next point and, and you know balancing scope with time to market. You know we we engage with all sorts of different financial service providers, and I can see the the really really creative ones that you know would love to have all sorts of different um, ideas put into, into place and taken to market. And it's really about prioritizing and, and you know, getting something in the market, get it tested, know that there will be feedback. You know, I think for almost everyone, we don't yet know what we don't know. And the only way we're going to find out is to get our customers using these, these channels and get our end users uh, engaging. And then we will have a much better idea. So. I think balancing scope with time to market, again, resisting the urge to getting everything absolutely perfect and as per the, the, the end vision, but rather looking for the short term. Um, and, and one of this perhaps that speaks a bit more to the challenges that, that we see is, is access to skills. And I think that this is very relevant for a lot of MFIs. You know, whether organizational structure is still around an IT manager that now 
suddenly is charged with digital transformation when we all know that digital transformation is as much a culture and an organizational change as it is introduction of new technologies. So how MFIs are accessing uh, skills um, and how those, you know, the, the importance of, of the strategy and the digital strategy and the technology decisions that are being made, you know, it's no longer the case that, okay, well, perhaps the core banking system isn't working quite the way we wanted it to, but business goes on as usual. Now technology decisions are fundamentally affecting uh, business performance. And what that means is that, you know, we need technology know-how spread right across the organization and upwards to the board. And, and I'm involved in a lot of discussions at board governance level whereby, you know, a lot of boards are quite intimidated by technology decisions. They know they need to be guiding their organizations through this transformation process, but they're not quite sure how to even understand some of the technology challenges and decisions that need to be made. So I think access to skills uh, is, is, is very important at all levels. Demystifying some of the tech talk and, and understanding what's going to be relevant, uh, you know, not only in the formulation of a strategy, but obviously implementation, as you say. So those are some of the, the things that, that certainly I've picked up from, from our experiences, and I'm obviously happy to expand on any of those as you see fit. Great. Thanks, Geraldine. Um, fascinating to hear you as a software vendor talk about the need for culture <laughs> change. I think we're going to come back to that. Um, Take a pause and do two things. One, ask everybody to keep your phones on mute, and if you're speaking, don't shuffle papers around because we get noise through the lines, so um, just watch out for that. Um, and also send your questions in. So I'm kind of fr frantically scribbling questions here as follow-up, but um, we'd love to hear from all of the people on the line, so please do start sending your questions in. Um, so I'm now going to turn over to Momina Ayazuddin from the IFC. Um, and Momina, you have a really different perspective on this as a, an investor. So how do you think about digital transformation for your clients? How does the IFC support its clients on digital transformation? And are you seeing evidence that this is making a difference in their bottom line? Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Greta. And hello, everybody. I'm delighted to be here to share with you IFC's experience. So we are, uh, you know, pretty involved as an investor. We work with a network of about 800 financial institutions, which include 300 MFIs, you know, almost 100 fintechs, as well as some of the larger banks. So when we think of digital transformation, it is also to see how one can leverage different aspects of some of these relationships amongst the, the players. I think one of the persistent challenges that we've seen in microfinance is cost and efficiency of delivery. So in my mind, digital transformation and this you know, whole push towards technology and innovation can help address those two challenges that microfinance has had, that were expensive for our clients, um, that we uh, persistently have high interest rates. So part of the discussion that we have internally is to how do you reduce, address those two challenges. The second, I mean, we are involved on the investment side. So with our portfolio of clients, we're also very aware that we want to partner with the institutions who are and support them in their effort to make this transition towards digital transformation because it's beyond just digital strategy. It is how, or being digital, it is how do you survive as a company in a digital era? Uh, a lot of clients, you know, I mean, even uh, Mark mentioned Myanmar, a lot of people have more cell phones and bank accounts. And so you're dealing even in especially the fragile and conflict environments, uh, places like Africa and others, where people are increasingly more aware and big users of technology, right? They have Facebook accounts and things. So how does one keep up with, with that aspect? So on our side, we've done these digital readiness reviews and process engineerings, and we look very actively at digitization of the current portfolio to see who can make that transition. And, you know, some of that work involves looking at, you know, obviously the software and data uh, use of um, use of technology in, like, streamlining the credit approval process. But it also looks at three levels. The governance aspect, you know, shareholders' governance, have they bought into this or not? Uh, what capacity or willingness do they have to move into a more digital era, competitive benchmarking in terms of the market? And it's been quite insightful in terms of 
uh, where these institutions are when you start benchmarking, for instance, an MFI versus a fintech in that market versus a bank or versus some of the newer players. Uh, on the advisory side, we've been involved with several digital transformations, about 60 at last count. In LAC, Africa, and the Middle East, we have about 60 ongoing. And it's been very interesting to see some of these lessons. One is that digital strategy is usually the starting point, um, but it cannot be divorced from a commercial or business strategy. I mean, uh, you know, I uh, remember having a conversation with one of these banks. They were like, yes, we have a, a chief technology officer he and his team are sitting three buildings down, right? You know, it was completely divorced from operations. And even some of the leading MFIs that we're working with see digital as I mean, almost too big to handle within the core business of the MFI uh, because of legacy systems, et cetera. So it's almost easier to have it as a separate thing. So to play at the fringes with, you know, agent banking or, or channels rather than have it uh, intrinsically part of the institution itself. But having said that, there's been a whole evolution. I mean, Ruth mentioned, uh, like the previous speakers have mentioned this, that there is a transition going on in the industry where uh, MFIs are thinking more holistically. So beyond developing products or channels, they're thinking really at different aspects of this. So one would be the, the use of data. Um, I mean, when I think about, you know, the more evolved ones, in China, CFPA, for instance, where we've invested in, has partnered with Ant Financial, and they're using data much more, collecting multi-dimensional data, and the use of, of this data would be structured as well as, you know, within the, the current client data as well as outside data. And that helps them build a rich, better risk portrait for their clients. So they're able then to develop products um, which are more suited to clients uh, and also just streamline a lot of the repeat client uh, business. But they're also using some of this risk modeling to improve their credit approval processes. And one thing I found is that MFIs are sitting on a lot of data. I mean, we've been in the business, many of these MFIs for like 30, 40 years. And honestly, in this day and age, one doesn't have an excuse not to understand the client data, because especially if you've been lending to them for that long. Um, the second thing is there is usually a confusion about, uh, you know, client centricity. I mean, most of us are saying that, you know, that, okay, we have field officers, but, and, you know, the field understands, but in, uh, in some deployments we've seen that there is a huge uh, legacy system that are particularly problematic. So it's not just the technology, but the change management process, which is critical. I mean, you need to convince your loan officer that his job is no longer irrelevant. The clients that this is, you know, switching to perhaps, you know, these newer channels or newer products will be in their best interest, that it is responsible and transparent. But also of both, uh, I think Geraldine mentioned that, that the change management process has to be very, very um, well understood and articulated at the board as well as shareholders. Uh, so, you know, I'm thinking of, uh, you know, some NGOs that we're working with where the average level of uh, age of the board is, you know, 80 years old. And obviously the discussion around digital transformation will be very different from one where you have a fintech or banker sitting on the table. Um, and, you know, some of it is the lack of capacity, uh, you know, um, in terms of there is a recognition we need to upgrade skills and we need to have a new way of thinking, but then how do you make that transition? Uh, so we need certain in-house capabilities, and how do you link that to business objectives? How do you identify digital drivers and new ways of thinking? Um, so, you know, in a lot of our deployments now, we're also thinking about revising KPIs. How can you link these KPIs, for instance, to client satisfaction results or the bottom line? Uh, the business case is difficult. Um, I mean, when I think about many of the clients that we're working with, uh, there's very lively discussions in terms of how this will, is, it, is this just the cost of doing business, of us remaining relevant, or will this actually help us increase our market share? Um, so we've been doing, you know, a lot of training around this, including with our Back to Boulder program, where we've trained over 200 C-suite executives. The next round is coming up in, in December, as well as our DigiLab program in, in LAC, where we're literally taking MFIs and uh, CEOs, CEOs, like decision makers and boards 
through a very guided process in terms of demystifying, uh, as you say, about you know certain aspects of uh, of this, as well as sharing experience. I mean, I think the peer networking is very critical even within a market. So I think the challenges for us still remain. I mean, I think it is very much a digital metamorphosis. You know, there are very few butterflies out there, <laughs> partly because legacy systems can uh, can hamper um, many institutions, and shareholders are fairly relentless, uh, as well as boards, in terms of the impact on the bottom line, right? Uh, especially when it comes to these huge investments in software, technology, and even a different way of doing business. You know, there's no guarantee that it'll result in. Uh, in a better business or bottom line. So I think from our perspective, the challenges still remain that it's not just a technology play. It has to be a, a more holistic way of looking at it. The change management aspect is equally tied up with incentives for management and, and the board. And some of these new products really have to be designed with a customer in mind. I mean, in the end, the motivation has to be who you're trying to reach. And if technology can be the enabler in reducing those costs, that is a more compelling argument than doing something new and sexy simply because it's the flavor of the month. Um, and that's it, I think, uh, from my side. That, well, we love customer centricity, so <laughs> that was a great place to finish. Um, so, Graham, right, you now have the unenviable position of speaking <laughs> after all of these amazingly um, knowledgeable people, but I know you and I know that you always have really good things to add. So I'm going to hand over to Graham now. Um, Graham, MSC, has worked with a lot of financial institutions um, going through digital transformation. I, I know you've worked a lot with Equity Bank, but with a lot of other um, organizations in India and Africa in particular. You know, what are the kinds of questions clients come to you with? What are the things that they really um, grapple with? And what are some of the key takeaways from your work? Because you have a view across lots of different organizations from a very operational point of view. So we'd love to hear any thoughts that you have that, you know, complement or add to what others have said here. Great. Um, thanks, Greta. And um, yes, uh, it is uh, indeed a challenge to follow um, some great great thoughts and presentations, so um, I will do my best. Um, as you say, we've, we've worked with a wide range of, you know, very large banks, uh, um, cutting edge banks like uh, Equity Bank, all the way through to MFIs um, like Shakti and Buro in, in Bangladesh, for example, um, on, on a wide variety of approaches to digital transformation. And, and what I thought I would do with my nine, 10 minutes is just talk about what we're seeing in terms of the questions being asked and, and, and how we address those. <clears throat> what we find that very often is that people, um, including frankly, quite a few consulting organizations, focus too much on, on processes and channels um, without seeing the holistic that um, uh, previous speakers have talked about. You know, digital transformation is, a, you know, all about getting digital solutions and tools delivered digitally, riding on, on, a, on a, a digital technology, a, a stack, um, and providing, and I think this is the most important, providing a seamless, a seamless user experience so that customers, um, uh, you know, become more uh, sticky uh, to the organization because the organization is really meeting uh, their needs. And, and, and if we're very honest, I don't think we've done that terribly well in traditional uh, microfinance. Very often we don't know what we're up against and nor do indeed to the institutions until we've done um, a digital readiness assessment. Um, so very often what we wind up doing is an introductory training um, on digital transformation, which we developed for and with IFC. Um, and then we conduct our digital readiness assessment that looks at what uh, the institution has in terms of um, opportunities and challenges for digital transformation. The basis of that allows us to build a digital transformation strategy that then can go to the board. And as previous speakers have noted, board buy-in is essential. 
and um, very often we wind up having to do a sort of condensed version of the, the uh, digital transformation training for boards in order to help them understand what the digital readiness assessment that we've conducted means and therefore why, you know, why the strategy hangs together. And then ultimately there are four components that we have typically had to work on. The, as I said, the traditional uh, processes and channels, which I'll unpack in, in due course, then the business uh, product and business models, and then, and then finally the customer engagement um, and user experience. And that's what really matters. That is where everything starts to pay off. And if you get too bogged down on looking at supply side savings for the organization without understanding how the customer experiences um, the, 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 the new systems and products, um, you will lose your way. It's as simple as that. So now the digitization of, 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 of processes as a consequence needs to look at processes from the customer perspective from the get-go. So instead of traditionally starting as we, as we used to perhaps with a, um, uh, a cost efficiency or, or risk efficiency trade-off through optimizing processes, we now start by looking at the impact of those processes um, on the end client. Um, so that, that takes us into client relationship management, marketing and onboarding, workflow management, um, obviously appraisal and analysis, then the basic transactional uh, flows, and then finally, obviously, controls and risk management. When we're looking at channels, again, the majority of people get hung up on agents and don't think about the full range of channels that are available. So beyond the standard agents that everyone knows and loves, um, obviously there are smart ATMs, um, there are unstaffed credit center booths, internet banking, um, and I think most important is the mobile app because if you can get customers to do their own transactions, um, they're A, able to do them wherever they want, and B, um, the costs for the organization um, plummet. When we're looking at products, I, for a while we've always all talked about um, tools, not products, and I think the digital transformation um, allows us finally to focus on use cases and tools and not products. So we tend to think about those in terms of how do our customers get money, how do they protect that money, how do they invest it, how do they save it, how do they borrow, and then how do they spend. So those are, and that's how the, um, what used to be products um, are now are formulated. Um, in the apps, at the agents, and so on, so that the ex customer experience is in their language and delivering on their use cases. And that leads me back to my final, final overall point um, about the process of digital transformation. Ultimately, this is all about user engagement. So ensuring that you have a really clear understanding of users' expectations in terms of the efficiency of, servicing, of services, fair pricing, clear user language, access to grievance redress, et cetera, and their experience in terms of um, ensuring that the, the, the tools or the use cases uh, reflect their behaviors, needs, attitudes, uh, and perceptions, and that uh, any bottlenecks are quickly resolved, and that we use proper design thinking in order to personalize the experience. Delivering on customer expectations and experience is the key um, to effective digital transformation, not the supply side alone. Well, let's have a quick look, if we may go to the next slide, 
at what happens if you get it right. So we started working with Equity Bank on this in about 2010-11. And the first thing that we saw was the rise of agency. And um, that began to eclipse uh, the use of ATMs and branches. Um, the use of ATMs and branches didn't and still hasn't really fallen significantly. But what has taken off like a rocket is the use of user-initiated transactions, transactions made by customers on their mobile phones. So that now over three quarters of all the transactions for Equity Bank happen on a mobile phone and are uh, user-initiated. This is extraordinarily important because, of course, the cost to the bank is almost negligible um, for those user-initiated transactions. So it has a direct um, lead-in to the bank's bottom line. So in summary, if you want to start on this journey, and it is, as previous speakers said, very much a journey, not a destination, um, if you want to start, I would strongly recommend that you start with some initial immersion training to give you an idea about the options around digital transformation, and then do a re digital readiness assessment to see what your, your assets and liabilities in terms of digital transformation look like so that you can build a credible strategy for your board. And actually, um, SPTF have a fund to co-finance both training on digital transformation and indeed um, a di digital readiness assessment. And I'll, I'll put the coordinates of those funds uh, up in the, um, uh, the chat. Thanks very much. Thanks a lot, Graham, and to all the panelists. There's a lot of material to work with here. I've been furiously scribbling things down, and I'm going to try to sort of frame some questions. And then we have a lot of questions coming through, so I'll start um, asking some of those pretty quickly, too. Um, and because we have so many panelists, what I'm going to do is direct questions at specific people. But if you want to chime in on a specific topic, just speak up, and we'll, we'll make sure to make time for you. So first, maybe an observation. What I have heard from every single one of you, including the technology vendor, is the importance of human beings in the digital transformation process. So what this says to me is this is not really about digital transformation. It's about culture transformation. It's about institutional transformation. And so it really is top to bottom. I heard that from every single one of you. So, you know, thinking about customers and putting customers at the heart of what you're doing, um, convincing staff that they need to engage in a different way. Um, you know, management really needs to, to have the board on side and you need to bring the board along. Sometimes the board is 85 years old, so that creates some new challenges. Um, so I'm really struck by, you know, the extent to which human beings are at the center of these digital changes. So the technology in many ways is kind of the easy part of the equation, although I acknowledge, you know, to Mark and and Geraldine's points that it's, it's hard for people to figure out and getting that right is important, but there's also a human element to it. And so I'm, I'm really interested in hearing from panelists on this topic. But let me, in that context, put a couple of questions to you from people who are listening in online because I think they help illustrate that. Um, so I'm going to do them in, in pairs. Um, so one question from, um, and I'm sorry if I get your name wrong, but um, Mujahid Asfan um, is, are technological trends in digital transformation solutions for banks and fintechs relevant for MFIs? And then a sort of companion question, and I don't have the name because I cut and pasted it into something else, might digital transformation be killing the core fabric of group lending? So let me put those two questions. Um, I'm going to start with maybe Graham, you could respond to that. And then um, maybe Momina, I'd like to hear from you on those two questions. So Graham, how about you first? Uh, thanks. Um, so I, I, yeah, I would make a couple of comments on those, on those questions. I mean, the first thing is that the, the bigger banks and the fintechs are going to work to address traditional microfinance markets using digital te technology. That you can take as a given. Given that, my biggest concern is actually not about the demise of groups, because we've seen in Bangladesh, for example, um, the home of all groups, that um, you know, attendance of group meetings is, is 
increasingly limited. Um, my concern actually is much more about a very deep digital divide that we're, we're, we're building up because um, we have a situation where the big banks and fintechs will service the higher value urban uh, 3G connected customers. And if they do it well, they will steal those customers from traditional MFIs, leaving them with the remote, rural, hard to reach, low value customers on which they will struggle to break even. And I think if we don't take that uh, risk seriously or MFIs don't move quickly to also digitally transform, we will see many of them die an analog death. Okay, um, Momina. Uh, I actually agree with a lot of what Graham was saying. I think is digital transformation relevant for most MFIs? I don't think it's a choice anymore. Um, uh, some of it has to be relevant, and part of it is you know, this, uh, the whole issue of cost and efficiency. Because if there are providers in your market who are able to provide the same clients that you're working with, loans within three minutes or 10 minutes, uh, you know, one will have to up one's game. I think part of the whole discussion on mission drift uh, centers very much about the credit aspect um, you know, credit and digital credit, whereas there are a lot of uh, different products that could um, be very useful uh, in, in digital transformation. So this whole push on deposits where it's been very successful has been on some of the uh, agent banking and, you know, newer channels in order to attract uh, small-scale depositors, uh, other products which would be uh, relevant for this, but it can't be for everybody, right? Like any other sector, um, there will tend to be economies of scale. Uh, the, it really depends which clients you're trying to reach. I think my fear is also that a lot of the underserved and unbanked tend to be rural and women and those who are living in very fragile and conflict-affected countries. So, I mean, we've seen, you know, a few business models who are able to succeed uh, like that in Congo, et cetera. But it is, uh, it is a very lively debate that we're having even within <laughs> our own institution with the FinTech team where they anticipate that in another 10, 15 years, all lending in any shape or form will be digital. Um, and those who don't make the transition to that will, uh, will suffer. So, but I mean, that's one extreme view, but I think a lot of institutions are realizing that they do need to reduce costs and be efficient and be able to serve their clients properly. And if you don't use technology to bring that down, when you have those tools available and you're not able to use them, um, then it is a severe competitive disadvantage to you. Great. So, so can I, I, sorry, can I make yeah. one supplementary point? I do apologize, yeah, yeah. but, but I, I do think that MFI shouldn't, um, disappear into a funk of depression over this discussion because they have a lot of really important comparative advantages and those are around the data that they have as Momina said earlier let's hope it's in decent shape that's something you have to look at in a digital readiness assessment but they also have ongoing relationships with with people and we know from studies including the Axion Central study that uh, poor people want that human touch, and mm -hmm. and and I think that um, there is going to be a real struggle for peop for lenders that want to do purely digital, um, because they will continue to have the high default rates that we're seeing with um, the the consumer digital credit that is uh, pervasive across Africa nowadays. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks for that, Graham. So another question that came in from people listening in, and I'm going to direct this to Ruth. Um, how can training and education about the digital transformation efforts of financial services providers be synchronized for both the supply side, in other words, change management and skills for managers and staff, and the demand side to make sure that the customer understanding and centricity about how products and services are changing keeps pace with that change. So, you know, how do you bring the organization along to make sure that both supply and demand are synchronized? Would welcome any thoughts you have on that, Ruth. Sure, that's a great question. And I think I'll start outside of the uh, microfinance or financial services industry 
and go back to foundations of education systems. Um, our foundation is very active in, in uh, secondary school education, tertiary uh, education supports. And if you also take a look at the uh, World Development Report put out by World Bank this year, the whole notion of the Human Capital Index and of building, building um, capabilities in people from birth um, around numeracy, literacy, getting good childhood, early childhood education, following through foundational skills in, um, in, in literacy and in numeracy in primary school and then moving on towards secondary school. So it's a, long, um, it's a broad and, and long trajectory to build up that skill set because it's not just the digital literacy component. If you want really effective, I mean, there's a lot of um, uh, adaptations that you can do with digital interface without many strong foundations, but to build a broader world in where both supply and demand is better aligned around this capability, you know, you, you want to take a longer term view and you want to make sure those foundations are in place. So I think um, to not answer the question specific about building customer capability and also about the supply side capability, there is a notion of ongoing education and bringing your customers along. And it is also this holistic view that it's not, it's not just a supply side journey. It is also a customer journey. Um, in some of the work that we did with the IFC, we, the, the team explored through ethnographic studies uh, people's sense of, of attitudes, trust in digital, historical experiences with banks, with formal providers, with money, um, social and economic hierarchies play into this. So it's, it's understanding holistically, not just the, the customer from a transaction or a product perspective, but understanding the customer more, much more holistically about what makes them think and tick, uh, what, what influences their choices, um, and then how to build a, a positive user experience out of that. And I think Graham touched on, on the user experience as well. You know, you begin with the end in mind. If you don't have a strong customer value proposition or a way of engaging low-income customers, no matter what you do on the, on the supply side or training your staff on the supply side, you're going to miss the boat um, just as badly as, as the big digital divide that, that Graham also spoke about. So there are resources, but it's a different way of thinking. And I, the, the challenge with change is that, you know, as human beings, um, and Greta spoke about this, as human beings, we, we define ourselves by what we do. We, we, we are what we do. And so if what we do starts to shift, you start to rethink what you, you know, what, well, what was I and what, what will I be now? But it's this mental shift um, it's a paradigm shift, and, and I think it's an opportunity. It's not a time to, to um, necessarily just wring our hands either, but it's an opportunity to think differently, to lead differently, and, and to, to think long-term and to think holistically. Thanks a lot, Ruth. Um, Mark and Geraldine, this is a question for me. Um, you guys have both spoken um, quite... Um, in a quite interesting way about um, building agility in the organization. To, to really transform the organization top to bottom, you need to have agility and you need to sort of communicate from the top to the bottom down to customers. How do you get an organization, how do you move an organization towards being agile? So, you know, what, what have you guys seen in your experience that can move an organization that way? And what would you recommend to others who are thinking about going through this transformation process about how they build agile into the organization and, and get that buy-in? Um, you know, either from organizations that you've worked in or ones that you've advised. Because, you know, I think the cultural shift for many microfinance organizations is pretty big. You know, there's a set way of doing things, and you're kind of asking people to move to a completely different um, way. So would welcome from Mark first and then from Geraldine, any observations you have on what you've seen work and what you've seen not work? <clears throat> yes, excellent. Um, excellent point to reflect on. Um, we've we've talked about the need. Several people have talked about the need of you know getting support from the top of the organization for this initiatives. And I think 
that while that is very true, along with it comes uh, um, one of the biggest challenges that institutions have, and that is that agile is a business practice that needs to come from the bottom up. And by that, I mean that the only way agile will work is that one institutions have to hire people who have the skill sets to actually run agile. Agile is at its core a software development practice. And if you don't have people in your institutions that have experience as product owners, scrum masters, um, the project managers, uh, the QA piece, um, you simply can't develop software-based solutions. So, so a big piece of this is just literally technical ability. And then the hardest part, and I think where um, what separates successes from failures is that a lot of these initiatives get pushed by a very charismatic, um, enthusiastic CEO, or maybe that also comes with some a, a few champions at the board level. Um, but that kind of enthusiasm translates quickly into micromanagement from the top down. And I think the single hardest thing for institutions to do and the single hardest thing for strong leaders to do is to actually implement um, agile and lean processes, which means pushing the decision making down to the product teams. Because the only way that you get customer focused sort of rapid cycle um, innovation is by pushing that down to the team that's actually in front of the client, putting in prototypes and actually developing um, the product so that it actually works for the customer. And I think therein, you know, it, it, at, in it, at microcred, we tried to transform a microfinance institution. And the one thing that we had at Yoma Bank was that Yoma Bank was a corporate bank that had zero retail products and services, none. And so because we were able to start with a completely blank slate, we were able to build that with a completely different corporate culture. And I think for a lot of institutions, it's going to be, how do you find the space in your institution to where you can start introducing this very, very different way of pushing key decisions that typically managers, CEOs in particular, think that they have to be involved in? How do you push that down to the product team level? Great, thanks, thanks Mark. Geraldine, yeah. Um, yeah, just, just to add on to that, and it's, it's a very timely discussion because, you know, we have 100-odd projects running at the moment, and what I see sort of repeatedly with a, a lot of our clients, I won't say a lot, but increasing number of clients, is they say they want Agile, and during a selection process, and they want the benefits of Agile in terms of, okay, we don't know what we want, we'll, we'll design it on the fly, and then when you get down to sort of saying, okay, now I need a product owner on your side, I need A, B, C, and D in terms of, of skills and resources, they change their mind. And they decide, no, 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 okay, maybe we're not ready. And it's happened a few times, and I, I understand it. And yet, I, I've, and even as a vendor, it's, it's very difficult. We can organize ourselves in terms of, say, our R&D to be working in an agile way, but you know, our implementations, the best we can do, and when you say about what worked, I think that it's just to ease people in. Perhaps you're not going 100% agile, but you do agree phased implementations, you, you agree a smaller MVP to get started with, and people start to see that, you know, that this can work. And, you know, what everyone needs to see is success. And, and really, if you can show that with a small organization that perhaps is used to doing, you know, huge big projects and defining everything up front and doing this traditional. If you can buy the the opportunity to do one project differently and show them the benefits of doing it that way. So I think that's definitely what what worked. And I think that people shouldn't be intimidated by, oh, I'm not ready to to sign on the dotted line to do everything according to Agile, but I still am open to discussion about how we make this an iterative process and, and how we gauge. I think, um, you know, there are definitely some challenges and, and, 
you know, people often think, well, agile means I can't control the budget. I think that's a common misconception. Um, and, and we've certainly, you know, been able to discuss that with a lot of our clients and say, okay, look, it doesn't mean that, that you can't have control. You still will have control over the budget and the timelines. In fact, you have more control than, than you've ever had uh, previously. So, uh, you know, I think those are, those are two examples. The other example, I think it really depends on what you're doing. And this is sort of following on from what Mark said. When you're starting with a blank slate, Agile is great. And, and I mean that from whether you're building a, a solution from scratch or whether you're introducing a new product from scratch. When you're transitioning and, and moving, let's say, a loan process, uh, an existing loan process from, from being, say, paper-based to digital, it's, it's, a much harder, it's a much harder implementation to have. And when I talked previously about these low-hanging fruits, you know, digitizing a loan, uh, an existing loan product is not a low-hanging low fruit. Um, it, it's a complex process. It is, it is harder to break up into its composite parts because, you know, you can't do the loan without following four or five different steps. So it's hard to bring something to market. Uh, so, you know, the, the key sort of bit of advice that I'd have there is pick a project that can be well contained and well defined, at least to get started with. And, and you know, again, even if you're not doing the whole uh, full agile, just look at how you can break it down as much as possible and, and just show that within the organization as a success. And I think that that can drive some of the organization change. Great, that's super helpful. So now I, we have a whole bunch of questions coming in and so I'm gonna kind of group them together in three buckets. There's one set of questions around customers, another around regulators, and then I have a last question on, on the role of donors and investors. So let me, let me throw out some questions related to customers. Um, and I think the context for this is technology and digitization in some ways takes you a little bit apart from your clients, whereas microfinance certainly has been very involved in a high-touch relationship with customers. So with that in mind, you know, how, can, how can MFIs, and this comes from Robert Ongodia, um, how can MFIs and fintechs digitize this human touch and relationship with customers, which has been so fundamental in advancing financial inclusion in informal markets? But then, how do you think this differs when serving the most vulnerable? For example, um, women, displaced populations in conflict-affected states. Um, and well, let, let's leave it at that. And, and, and then we had another question, which is how, what are the impacts and effects of digital transformation in the gender relation balance within the MFIs and within the client's household? So we've got gender, we've got um, just reaching poor customers, and we've got um, conflict-affected states. So Momina, can I get you to take mm -hmm. the gender question? Mm -hmm. Graham, can I get you to take the question on just the distance between, you know, the technology distancing um, traditional MFIs? And Mark, coming recently from a conflict-affected state, Myanmar, can I get you to reflect on some of the challenges about using digital transformation to reach people in those populations? So can I start with mm -hmm. you, Momina, on the gender question? Okay, and uh, so in order to reach more women, so part, uh, and this can be uh, segregated into obviously the credit side, um, and in a lot of cases actually what we're seeing is like technology can enable blind <laughs> lending. Uh, so that can be a good thing in certain cases uh, where you're not actually uh, using uh, like, you know subconscious or human bias to determine who you're lending to. But partly, uh, I think for women, I mean, especially in FCS markets, uh, it goes beyond lending. I mean, I think you know what you're seeing is that women tend to be better agents uh, in certain cases, especially in you know like fragile and conflict affected areas. There is a huge um, movement now on you know like um, different innovations which are happening around the payment space in terms of refugee women. Uh, a lot of cases being played around in that in that aspect um, so I think that the bigger challenge will be where you end up having uh, like women who tend to be have smaller home-based businesses um, uh, and you know how do they transition up to you know larger ones and then certain cultural factors I mean you know even Bcash in Bangladesh um, you know a lot of women didn't want to use the, uh, some of the agents because it meant going into a basement and um, giving your phone number to a random man. So there have to be elements of like gender design built into some of these newer products, even if they are technology heavy. 
Graham, any thoughts from you on just the distance that digital places between a provider and their clients and how to sort of overcome that? How do you blend high touch with, with high tech? This is a really good question. And um, I make a couple of observations before I answer it. The first observation is that consumer digital credit that is prevalent across Africa um, is that it's largely consumer credit and it's in, given in very, very small bits, primarily because for all the talk of 10,000 data points, actually what the, these lenders are doing is giving out a very small amount of money, seeing whether it's repaid and then if it is giving out a marginally larger piece of money, um, repeat. So that, uh, frankly, is just traditional credit history lending, um, you know, uh, digitized. But the, at the moment, the majority of those loans are very small. Where digital uh, lending has a real advantage is in SME lending, where the small businesses have digital footprints. Um, and, and this is frankly, uh, outside perhaps parts of Asia, horribly underexplored and underused um, by, by people seeking to serve um, the, the, the underserved areas. Um, but if I return to traditional MFI lending, so micro enterprise lending, um, I think that even the traditional digital credit lenders will over time want some degree of human touch. And as uh, Momina said, that human touch will have to increase depend, you know, with the vulnerability of the, of the population. But it, just uh, by way of an example, we um, had a long discussion in India with uh, um, agents of a bank on whether they would help provide that uh, human touch and would um, act as sort of quasi loan officers recommending um, people f uh, for, for loans and then helping collect those loans. And the response was, don't ask us to collect loans that you made um, and have gone bad. We will simply burn social capital. But if you involve us in the loan origination process, we can then legitimately help you with the loan collection process. So I think that there are ways around the challenge and ways that we can use agent networks um, as well to drive the human touch. And obviously for MFIs transitioning, um, that, that transition process, um, the human touch will be driven by the loan officers because they will have a lot of work to do to help traditional MFI clients um, feel comfortable with uh, digital repayment, et cetera. Great. Um, Mark, very briefly, I wonder if you have any observations on working with um, low-income customers in fragile states, which Myanmar is. Um, certainly, yeah. Let me, let me start by taking off on Graham's comment, you know, about the, the element of human touch, because I, th I think for most markets, um, digital products and channels are simply going to be a piece of uh, of, a, of a broader customer experience that will always have elements of human touch in it. And so the, the art, and the smart art and science but in packaging those, those two things together so that they work for customers. Um, concrete example is that, you know, obviously um, your ability to have an agent network where people can do cash in, cash out remotely, and to have an app where they can self-serve solves a fundamental distribution problem, which is extremely useful in fragile states. You know, in a fragile state, you're limited to where you can put a branch. Um, uh, we had one of our branches blown up, you know, so there's just a, yeah, there's, there's those limits which you can get around with, you know, the technology, but you still have to have people out there able to, to interact with the customers and to answer their questions. Um, I do want to send up a cautionary, uh, a cautionary note here, though, and that is that if you think about the challenges that all of the panelists have talked about, um, for most institutions, you are not going to solve those problems with the most vulnerable and in the most difficult environments. Uh, the reality is, is that for most institutions that are at the beginning of their digital transformation journey, 
um, you will need to find uh, a more benevolent environment to be able to go through your own learning cycle in order to be able to develop um, you know, digital products and services that are going to work for these very, very vulnerable populations because that is the hardest, that's the hardest frontier out there. And that's a, uh, the, the technology can get you there, but that is probably not the place where you're going to hone it. Great. So, Mark, I'm going to stick with you on the next question and, and put this to Mark and Momina. Um, and this is a question about regulators. Um, I know both of you have lots <laughs> to say about this. Keep it polite. Um, so, there's a question about how regulators and policymakers can be brought on as partners to help advance the digital transformation um, agenda. From Charles Odoncourt, who, who gave us this question, from his experience, regulators have a tendency of frustrating innovation and digital transformation. I would add to that, regulators sometimes make it very hard for um, businesses to serve the very poor um, because they look at it through a different lens. So, I, you know, as we think about digital transformation and as we think about serving the poor, I'd love to hear from both of you, um, starting first with Mark, then Momina, on how regulators can help promote this process. Hmm. And as you said, it's difficult to be polite about this because, you know, regulators are the single greatest impediment to this process. Look, I think, I think before anybody starts in a market, I think that you have to take a very, very, you have to take stock of where the regulator is and how you can engage the regulator. Because if you can't, and if there are large pieces where the regulator is not willing to, or is not willing, let's say where the regulatory space is not there, you have to take that into account in your horizon and in your investment your, in your investment risk. Right? So a simple example would be, you know, will the regulator allow you to do digital onboarding? And if that is not yet available, then you have to calculate that it, maybe the regulator will give you that permission in a month and maybe, maybe they will make you wait three years. You know, I can tell you for Yoma Bank, regulators cost us over $15 million in, in making us wait on things. So um, I, I think that the, the single most important thing an institution can do is that this really requires engagement of the regulator upfront, minimally by the CEO, but probably also by the board chair. And this needs to be someone influential locally, and it, there needs to be a sit down with the regulator where the institution says, hey, this is what we would like to do. This is why we would like to do it. How does this fit into you as a regulator? How can we make this work together? And, and engage the regulator as a partner up front with a very clear exchange. And if you don't feel that the regulator is on board, I straight up wouldn't do it. I would not launch. I would not launch the initiative unless you really felt like the regulator was offering genuine commitment to the basic pieces that need to be in place to make it work. Okay, thanks a lot, Mark. And um, Momina, just very briefly. Yeah. So very briefly, I mean, obviously, like, you know, when you, uh, Mark was saying that we need, like, you know, the board to also engage with regulators. So you can imagine when the board themselves are not that convinced of digitalization, that it would be a very difficult play for regulators. So what is the regulator's concern? It is essentially to develop an inclusive financial system and to balance this whole aspect of risk and innovation. So we've been working along with our colleagues at the World Bank on these digital inclusive inclusion principles um, for the G20, and there were two aspects of which which are really relevant. One is, you know, making it easier. When you think of the, the larger markets which have digitization like India and China, it is very much a partnership between an innovative regulator and allowing innovation on the ground for uh, private sector models. The second is this awareness of digital financial literacy and awareness, right, that you're preventing over-indebtedness or uh, very high consumer lending uh, type models, even in the digital credit space, but also identifying the risk. So risk has to be very proportional. So a lot of the conversations that we and our colleagues at the World Bank are having with regulators is really about them being aware of what the risks and issues are, uh, partly also that they are playing regulatory catch-up. I mean, it, it, it is a very... Um, 
fast-growing space, um, and the need to balance, I think, some of the risk. Uh, you know, obviously there are clear risks in consumer protection and data privacy, uh, but it doesn't need to apply for every single kind of product. Um, most regulated, I think, where we've seen successful approaches is where uh, institutions have developed a pilot-based approach with regulators and said, okay, we won't go full scale. This is a little pilot that we're developing. We'll get it right. It'll be responsible, and then we will scale it up, uh, which often helps in getting some regulatory approvals up front. Okay, great. Thank you for keeping that short. So I, I'm going to also have sort of Twitter responses from Ruth and Momina. Um, just on, you know, Ruth spoke very much to the role that um, donors have played in sort of this space so far and how you're thinking about it going forward. If you could give me just a couple of quick responses as an investor, Momina, and then Ruth as a donor, how you guys are thinking about moving the frontier on digitization um, of, of financial institutions, financial services providers forward, um, building on what we've learned so far. Um, mm -hmm. Are you happy to go first, Momina? Yeah, that's right. I think we've learned a lot of lessons from the financial, traditional financial inclusion space, you know, from microfinance, SME. Um, I think there are very few business models out there which are commercially viable and able to scale. So our, uh, our focus really is in being able to identify, support those early stage interventions, whether it's through investment or advisory, and really being able to share some of those models across the board. Because I think uh, for this to be really sustainable, we will need to see uh, very responsible, inclusive business models which are able to deliver not just for shareholders and the MFIs, but also for clients. Uh, and the moment you can see that, there needs to be much more of that across the board, uh, not just in the larger, more evolved markets. Sorry, that wasn't very Twitter-friendly, no, but... Okay. It was pretty <laughs> um, Ruth, any thoughts from you on, on donors generally, but also how MasterCard Foundation is thinking about this? Mm -hmm. So I think donors always have a role to play in innovation and learning and testing. Um, but going forward um, in, the, in the foundation's new strategy, I think what we're wanting to do is looking at the trends and what we've learned and what we know around uh, digitization and financial inclusion, and then thinking about digitization in the real sector. Because what we want to do is convert not just the financial angle, but figure out how to digitize agri-value chains, figure out how to digitize uh, there's very in, in, innovative applications around um, education and digitization. There's innovations around healthcare and, and digitization. There's innovations going on in the construction sector because our, our new strategy is really about looking at finance and access to finance for young people as an enabler of, and an engine of economic growth and jobs and, and entrepreneurship. Because uh, we are, we, we as a foundation at MasterCard are focusing on, on Africa. We know that the biggest um, opportunity coming up in the next 20, 30 years is the youth demographic. We know there's a huge need to equip and think about a pipeline in addition to the existing um, number of young people that are already um, active and, and of working age. And thinking then about how digitization and digital finance can leverage all these other opportunities and digitization in other spaces. So I think that's where our foundation is thinking and looking at for, for the future. Great, thank you. And then I'm going to put one last final question. We still have quite a few people online, and so we're going to run over just a tiny bit, but if you need to drop off, feel free to. But we had a question from um, Pam Easer um, asking the panelists to give their thoughts on whether they think digitally linking informal savings groups, which are majority women, majority rural, represents a viable path for last mile inclusion. And I'd like to ask Geraldine to answer that question. Great. Thanks, Greta. A subject near and dear to my heart because I always find, you know, the, the, the numbers within the savings group sector are still, you know, despite all the digital innovation and certainly digital credit and everything that exists in, in East Africa, the digital, the savings groups numbers are, are still huge. And I think there's a lot of lessons to, to be taken from why they persist and, and why people continue to, to choose that, even if they are formally financially included. Uh, but obviously the question here is about people who, who are possibly not included and, and what it can mean. And I, I do truly believe, I know there's a lot of initiatives to, to test out linkages uh, between savings groups and formal financial institutions, um, either with telco-led M wallets or with, with banks or MFIs. I think that 
there are definitely some some challenges and some lessons I've seen learned along the way include sort of this engagement uh, with the with the uh, savings group is there you know do, is this requiring NGO involvement to train the group and and understand I think the, the from the financial service provider side there's been challenges for them to innovate and create the right products to appeal to the savings group. Um, you know, as we the savings groups are cyclical, they're very price sensitive on transaction flows, and, and yet they they may clear their account out at the end of the year. So it, it's not a traditional savings account that the bank may think about it. Um, but there is very much uh, a demand for it. What I've seen in the market is that as people sort of wake up to the understanding of the level of data that could come from these informal savings groups, uh, that, that more and more uh, FSPs are looking to linkage programs, um, which is great. It could mean that somebody who's formally financially excluded now ha actually has some type of credit history for them to be assessed with. Of course, the, where there's a good side, there's also could be a bad side, and people worry about you know, credit uh, coming into these groups that, that you know, have been managed um, within themselves and, and very differently. Um, so, you know, I think there's definitely potential, there's definitely lessons that, that need to be navigated. The, the consumer consent side of things is, is critical in terms of people really understanding what's being done with their data as it is collected. But I do think that banks uh, particularly are opening up to this. Um, and it's, it's about finding the last mile link to the savings groups that will teach and train the savings group. It's all about the literacy side, which we've talked about earlier. Okay, thank you, Geraldine. So um, we have now officially overstayed our welcome on timing, and so I'm going to wrap up um, first by thanking our audience who have been keeping me on my toes by sending through lots of really excellent questions that I've tried to get to the panelists in um, sort of uh, reasonably coherent ways. Um, but I'd also like to thank our excellent panelists because I have a whole bunch of questions about partnerships, data, everything you guys have talked about that we didn't even get to. So I think that means we have lots of fuel for a later conversation. A couple of just wrap-up issues. Um, so if you could please take a moment to answer the brief survey that you'll see on the right um, panel of the WebEx screen. We would greatly appreciate having your feedback on this webinar. It helps us to make sure that the webinars we do in future meet our audience's needs. Um, we will. We did record this webinar, and we will be um, emailing you a link to that when it is ready. It'll be available also on the microfinance, the FinDev Gateway website, Valdete. Um, Please feel free to continue this discussion um, on the Gateway LinkedIn group. Um, there's a link that's been shared in the chat box. And um, just a trailer for a couple of um, sessions that we have coming up in this webinar series. So it's a whole series of webinars on, on digital transformation. The next one is on making change happen, lessons from microfinance institutions. And there will be one specifically on the role of technology in digital transformation. So if you didn't have your question asked about technology, and there were quite a few, um, please feel free to join us. I think Geraldine is joining for that conversation as well. So I'd like to thank my um, panelists, uh, give them a big round of virtual applause. Um, it was an excellent conversation, and thank you to the audience for joining us. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.